Welcome to Praxis 913. Our topic today is left populism. The spark is Chantal Mouffe's new book, an impassioned plea for a left populism, just published at Verso. In her short, compelling political intervention, Mouffe argues for a soft form of strategic rhetoric of populism on the left in order to assemble a broad coalition of all those who've been left out during the past 40 years of monolithic, hegemonic, global neoliberalism. As a discursive device, Mouffe argues, left populism can construct an embracing we the people around the unsatisfied demands of all those who today feel left out, not just the working class, but also women, minorities, LGBTQ, immigrants, and other marginalized populations. Her objective is to reassemble all those who are making unsatisfied claims, those who, even those who have succumbed to right-wing populist discourse, and to unite them all against the oligarchs, against those in power. Now, Mouffe argues that left populism is, in fact, the only way to, in her words, stop the rise of right-wing populist parties. She writes, uh, to stop the rise of right-wing populist parties, it is necessary to design a properly political answer through a left populist movement that will federate all the democratic struggles against post-democracy, she says. I believe that if a different language is made available, many people might experience their situation in a different way and join the progressive struggle. Now, her, her book is specifically not intended to be an academic intervention, as she tells us. It's not intended to debate the real nature of populism, but rather, uh, in her words, it's intended to be a political intervention, a political intervention, uh, and uh, the book is meant to be um, a political intervention, and it openly acknowledges its partisan nature, she writes. Uh, in this sense, of course, it raises many important questions for us about praxis, um, and, uh, and I hope that we'll be able to debate some of those questions as well. Now, on that question of praxis, uh, specifically, we can put her book in relation to our earlier discussion at uh, Praxis 313 of Bernie Sanders and political revolution. Uh, Bernie may not claim to be a populist, few people do today, since it's predominantly used in a derogatory manner, just like few people claim to be neoliberals, um, but there's little question that his rhetoric is populist. Um, his whole discourse is about the American people, right? And reading just from the, from the introduction to the book that we read for 313, the American people, he writes, understand that health care is a right for all and not a privilege. The American people know that in the midst of massive wealth and income inequality, the very rich have got to start playing their fair share of taxes, paying their fair share of taxes, right? That's, that's what poll after poll shows the American people want, he writes. Um, this is your country. Help us take it back. Join the political revolution, uh, which, of course, we discussed at length uh, in 313. Now, and the same goes in part for Jean-Luc Mélenchon in France and for other movements in Spain and elsewhere. Now, many scholars criticize the project of left populism, arguing that in general, populism has an authoritarian tendency, that the populist mode of political organizing and gaining power has a way of distorting democracy in practice, that in effect there is a path dependency such that the rise of populist power ultimately corrodes liberal institutions and produces antagonistic, exclusivistic, anti-pluralist, and often autocratic forms of governing. I posted a lengthy introduction on the Praxis 13 website setting forth the larger debate and teeing up for us then the central question that we have and that we face tonight. Is Chantal Mouffe's call for left populism the right political choice to take at this time? Or does it feed into an authoritarian vortex that will ultimately undermine social democracy or liberal democracy? 
Now, to address these questions, we are spoiled tonight to have around the table what I consider to be the world's leading critical thinkers on populism. Uh, I was corresponding with our dear friend and colleague, uh, Etienne Balibar, who's in Paris. He sends his regrets. Um, but he referred to this seminar as the World Summit on Populism. <laughs> and, I, <laughs> and I have to say, knowing the field pretty well, and also having read uh, in detail the brilliant essays that our guests posted on the website, uh, and that you also have read, uh, I think indeed we are at the global summit here. Um, so uh, we're going to hear first uh, from Professor Sheila Benabib, who joins us uh, both from Yale University, where she's the Eugene Meyer Professor of Political Science and Philosophy, and from Columbia Law School, uh, where she is here this semester, uh, the James Carpenter Visiting Professor of Law. Uh, Professor Ben Abib is a leading critical theorist working now especially on issues of migration and citizenship and democracy. Her most recent book is titled Playing Chess with History, Exile, Migration, and Statelessness from Hannah Arendt to Isaiah Berlin, just out with Princeton University Press, which uh, explores precisely the questions of migration and citizenship, especially in conversation with the thought of Hannah Arendt, of which uh, she is a leading expert. She's the author of numerous other books, uh, from Critique, Norm, and Utopia, a study of the normative foundations of critical theory, and situating the self, gender, community, and postmodernism in contemporary ethics, all the way to dignity in adversity, human rights in troubled times. Uh, after Professor Ben Abib, we will hear from Professor Asian Kandas. Uh, Jandash. Jandash. Soft sea. Soft sea. Um, uh, who's Professor of Political Science and International Relations at Istanbul's Sofsi Bogaciki Boazic University, and currently serves as Rice Faculty Fellow and Visiting Associate Professor at the Yale, I can pronounce that one, Macmillan Center Council on Middle Eastern Studies. And we're especially delighted to welcome home Professor Chandas, who received her PhD from the Columbia University Department of Political Science. Uh, and worked, in fact, with Gene Cohen and Ira Katz-Nelson and uh, Jeremy Waldron. So, welcome home. Um, she specializes in the history of political thought, theories of justice and democracy, constitutionalism, pluralism, social policy, women's rights, minority rights, comparative study of Muslim-majority countries, and, of course, Turkey. And her recent publications include struggles imposed by the new hierarchical citizenship regime on marginalized groups and the LGBTI movement, and inequalities in Turkey. Uh, after Professor Chandas, we'll hear from uh, Professor Jean Cohen, uh, who is uh, the, Neil, the Nell and Herbert M. Singer Professor of Political Thought and Contemporary Civilization at Columbia University. Uh, professor Cohen is a leading uh, critical theorist working now especially on issues of populism uh, and popular sovereignty, human rights, uh, religion, and democratic constitutionalism, and gender and the law. Uh, Professor Cohen is recent, just recently presented a paper uh, on populism called What's Wrong with Theories of Left Populism at the Constellations Conference at Columbia University in November uh, of 2018, which focused precisely on these questions and the dangers of left populism. Professor Cohen is the author of numerous books, including Class and Civil Society, uh, The Limits of Marxian Critical Theory, uh, Civil Society and Political Theory, co-authored with Andrew Arato, uh, regulating Intimacy, a New Legal Paradigm, and Globalization and Sovereignty, Rethinking Legality, Legitimacy, and Constitutionalism. Um, after Professor Jean Cohen, we'll hear from uh, Didier Fassin, uh, who is the James D. Wolfenson Professor of Social Science at the Institute for Advanced Study in Princeton, and Directeur d'Etudes at the École des Hautes Études en Sciences Sociales in Paris. Uh, Professor Fassin is also a doctor by training and specialized in infectious diseases, and uh, he bridged those fields by studying medical anthropology in Senegal, Ecuador, South Africa, and France. Professor Fassin's research on AIDS in South Africa led to his conceptual framework uh, for the reproduction of social disparities. And through a 10-year ethnography of the French state, that's included research on police, justice, and the prison, uh, he's established a critical approach to anthropology and social science reflected in his recent books, The Will to Punish, and Life, a Critical User's Manual, both in 2018, and an Ethnography of the Carceral Condition in 2016. After Professor Fassin, we'll hear from Jan Werner Muller, uh, 
who is professor of politics at Princeton University, where he also directs the University uh, Center for Human Values Project on the History of Political Thought. Um, before going to Princeton, Professor Muller was a fellow at All Souls College at Oxford, a scholar of the history of modern political thought, democratic theory, constitutionalism, uh, religion and politics, and the normative dimensions of European integration. Professor Muller is the author of the acclaimed What is Populism, uh, which, is, which uh, the Washington Post described as the most useful work to comprehend Trump's appeal. Um, and uh, his book, uh, a Christian Democracy, uh, A New Intellectual History with Harvard University Press is forthcoming. Now, in addition, around the table, we have an extraordinary array of experts and, uh, and scholars on populism. Joining us is Professor Federico Finchelstein, professor of history at the New School and the author of another recent uh, central text on the topic of populism, especially in Latin America, called From Fascism to Populism in History, just out with California Press in 2017. Uh, Joseph uh, Jason Frank, as well, uh, professor, uh, the Robert Katz Chair of Government at Cornell University, expert on democ democratic theory. We're Rosalind Morris, we've got just a, a Camilla, we've got just a, a, a wealth of, uh, of voices. Uh, Jedediah Purdy, who joins us uh, this, uh, this month or last month uh, at Columbia Law School, we're thrilled to have you with us uh, now. So, um, so it's a real treat to be here, an honor uh, to be among uh, such a a uh, remarkable group of thinkers. So let me turn it over to Sheila Benabib to open up uh, our discussion then. Okay, thanks Bernard. Um, my comments this evening will be brief, which I'm sure many of you will be grateful for. In recent years, uh, my work has focused not on populism, but almost on all the issues that raise red flags and are hated by populists. I work on the ethics and politics of cosmopolitanism, immigration and the boundaries of the demos, intercultural understanding, particularly with respect to moderate Islam, and the promise and failures of the European Union, particularly with respect to Turkey. These have been my themes, not populism. There are excellent posts by colleagues for today's evening concerning the political sociology, history, and theory of populism. I want to begin, therefore, somewhere else. I've had a long-running disagreement with Chantal Mouffe over the years regarding her appropriation of Carl Schmitt for left emancipatory theory and about the very sharp distinction she draws between liberalism and democracy. I think that this leads her to an incoherent theory of radical democracy, as Jean Cohen also notes in her post. As is well known, in many works over the years, Mouffe has maintained that liberalism is anti-political because it aims or prioritizes consensus, thus eliminating the existential antagonism of friend foe that should be at the center of the political. Quoting Schmidt, he writes in the concept of the political, there exists a liberal policy of trade, church and education, but absolutely no liberal politics, only a liberal critique of politics, end of uh, quote. Certainly, Mouffe is aware that in Schmidt's philosophy, this critique of liberalism is accompanied by an essentializing distinction between friend and foe, and she herself does not essentialize the concept of the people. But, and Schmidt is himself too smart not to racialize the distinction between friend and foe, although neither can we overlook the fact that smack in the middle of the concept of the political, he, he defines the foe, the enemy, as an existential stranger, other, with whom a most intense kind of conflict is possible. Move polishes off the rough edges of Schmidt's existentialist and racially tinged authoritarianism and makes out of Schmidt's existential foe an innocuous adversary. The antagonism versus agonism dichotomy is supposed to articulate this transformation. This is not a coherent position. What kind of antagonism emerging out of pluralism is Move talking about? doctrinal, theological, or politically, socioeconomically based cleavages and differences, the concept of pluralism itself never gets explained. 
Because she is also at so much pains to differentiate liberalism from radical democracy, MUF also dismisses a theory of rights. She claims that liberalism has reduced democracy to free elections and the defense of human rights only, while radical democracy will be based upon the principles of equality and popular sovereignty. I leave aside questions of representation which uh, are raised by Nadia Urbanati in her reflections. But what exactly is equality if it is not first a right to equality before the law, a right to non-discrimination, an equal right to membership by the entitlement to a bundle of political and social rights? I want to remind you here uh, of the 1950 famous essay by T.H. Marshall, Citizenship and Social Class, where Marshall writes, the basic human equality of membership has been enriched with new substance and invested with a far formidable array of rights. It has been clearly identified with the status of citizenship. Now, what are some of the political strategic consequences of these theoretical commitments of MOVE's project? As a political intervention into European debates, MOVE is silent about the boundaries of the demos problem as well as the European Union. According to her, the hegemonic struggle to recover democracy needs to start at the nation state level because, I'm quoting, despite having lost many of its prerogatives, it is still the nation state is still one of the crucial spaces for the exercise of democracy and popular sovereignty, page 71. MUF thus joins Wolfgang Streich and other neo-nationalist European intellectuals who see in a reconstituted nationalism today the focal space for politics in Europe. Instead, I would plead for a pluralization of the sites of democratic struggle to include transnational as well as local regional struggles to join in with the national ones. A transnational strategy is vitally important for coalition building. Unless we, immigrate, uh, we integrate the migrants and refugee populations into the democratic struggle as well, unless we have a transnational analysis uh, of, for facing these issues, the boundaries of the demos will be re-established by the xenophobic and cruel discourse of exclusivist and ethnocentric nationalism. I have two final observations to make, but I will only talk about the uh, second because the first here is, I guess I am joining the chorus in um, uh, the thesis of what Bernard called path dependency about the prospect of populist politics uh, and populism once it's in power. My uh, uh, most important example in this case from recent history are the developments in Turkey. Turkey is often cited as a picture book case of populist movements, for example, also by Jan Werner in his first book. And I think that Aysham may probably go a little bit more into Turkish politics, maybe not, but we have seen where uh, Turkish populism has led. It's, it's not necessarily the only example, but I do share the general misgivings um, uh, voiced about this, uh, uh, this trend. One final observation. Wherever authoritarian, nativist, and plebiscitary modes of democracy have spread, they have been accompanied by attacks on high courts and constitutional courts. Hungarian Prime Minister Orban's court packing is well known, as are the recent efforts of the Polish Law and Justice Party to curtail the authority of the constitutional as well as regional courts. President Erdogan has been court packing for the last decade, and the new Turkish constitutional referendum has further curtailed the powers of the constitutional court. While these developments are uniformly condemned by progressives, attitudes towards international and transnational courts are quite equivocal. Many on the left see these institutions as undemocratic usurpers of the popular will. But my point here is neither that the decisions of multi-regional or multi-regional 
Latter courts are always solitary. The European Court of Human Rights has, in many cases, failed uh, dissidents and um, refugees as well as women wearing the hijab. Nor am I arguing that it is wrong for citizens to want to see that law is their law. However, I am stressing that behind the antagonism towards high courts and constitutional courts, as well as the hostility towards the European Court of Justice, the European Court of Human Rights, in the International Criminal Court, lies the desire of autocratic regimes not to have their authority challenged by inter internationally acknowledged human rights standards. The sovereignist drift of the United States Supreme Court was explicitly articulated by the late Justice Scalia. It picked up steam with Chief Justice Roberts' decision in the Kyobo case and is now touted all over the world by, uh, in foreign policy circles by John Bolton. To conclude, negotiating the conflicts and inconsistencies between expressions of popular will which is neither always fair nor wise, as Rousseau already had reminded us. And human rights constraints can be achieved in either one of two ways to negotiate this tension of democratic constitutional politics. Either you have hegemonic nationalism and democratic populism creating an unbridgeable gulf between respect for human rights versus acceding to the popular sovereign's demands thus paving the way toward a liberal democracy or autocratic presidentialism, or one can defend a cosmopolitan democracy through mobilization of, by which the popular will is modulated, even at times restrained by internationally recognized human rights standards. So for all these reasons, permit me therefore to be de deeply skeptical about Chantal Mouffe's energetic call for a left populism. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Benabi. Um, Hello, I'm, I'm here uh, from affirmative action, I think, uh, because as someone uh, witnessed, who has witnessed and who has been scarred forever by right populism in Turkey, and uh, it has turned me into an activist, despite the fact that I was a tenured professor uh, at Boğaziçi University, Istanbul. Um, the, what we have witnessed, the, uh, what happened to the institutions, uh, turned many of us into activists, and I'm a peace academic, and I'm in exile right now. So uh, I don't think my contribution is purely academic. It's, it's a combination of academic and uh, witnessing. Um, in my contribution, I think I have made eight essential points. I wrote these down because I have only eight minutes, I believe, and I already used one. So uh, I'll just highlight those. Uh, firstly, the field of the left contains not one, but two actors. And these have to be distinguished from one another. A substantive, existentially, and necessarily left-leaning egalitarian politics is something different from left populism as strategy. Secondly, the moment we are in is a very particular moment. We are in the initial stages of a technological revolution that's bound to begin to change both the mode and the relations of production. We are facing this challenge and the uncertainty also at a moment when we have had decades of deregulation which resulted in heightened levels of inequalities. Globalization created both upward and downward social mobility, created new classes, dissolved the old classes, and is continuing to lead to social and physical dislocations of peoples. Almost all around the world, an uneven development, an overlap of pre-industrial, industrial, industrial and post-industrial forms of existence, and therefore a, also a coexistence of traditional uh, materialist and post-materialist values emerge. Existing political institutions and the state, as we know it, uh, are under immense pressure and cannot change quickly enough to address the issues that render almost everyone anxious. 
while all countries are facing similar challenges, levels of internal diversity and integration, institution strength, existence of a liberal democratic culture or its lack, all will be effective in negotiating the regime outcomes. But the crises are objectively valid. This means that a substantively left-leaning, inclusive, egalitarian, creative, sustainable, realizable, programmatic, pro program-based, deliberatively formulated political agenda is also arising at this moment as a universalizable radical need, as I called it in my small contribution. Enters right-leaning populism as the first organized political response to crisis. Right-leaning populism's game plan is to get rid of the equal citizenship to create hierarchically organized, differentiated membership regimes that are reminiscent of caste systems. It wants to topple a legal rational form of law, constitutional limits, and deliberative mechanisms, and replace these with unaccountable, top-down, charismatic leader-based forms of domination. Its strategy is to divide economically insecure masses into rival identity groups, while it runs on radical nationalism, uses racism strategically, and politicizes religious difference, enters left populism. Left populism is not stepping into a political vacuum, but into this dynamic, contentious political field. Left populism regards the populist moment as an opportunity to come to power on the basis of charismatic leadership and potentially reduces democracy so, to its electoral majoritarian meaning, as well as into a leadership problem. It wants to energize and mass mobilize a rainbow coalition composed of old and new social movements against the old establishment. It wants to informally unite the masses through the leader figure without formally organizing them and with no institutions in between and wants to get rid of the formal sty style of organizing that stood on the basis of political parties, deliberative bodies and civil society associations. When right and left populists are both in the dynamic field, it becomes apparent that they have common targets. Both want to eliminate the center, the middle, the organizing principles of constitutional democracies that they call altogether the establishment. Therefore, populisms cooperate to a certain extent to weaken the norms and institutions. I call this left populism's supporting actor role. Muff, of course, qualifies this in her book, but as her theory at the end of the day relies on the leadership principle, what happens is ultimately up to the leader. In that sense, I think it could replicate all of these problems that I'm underlining. Populist strategy, left or right, needs to define an adversary, as it contains no internally consistent program, its only consistent and marketable commodity is its brand, <laughs> And what better way to give a unified identity to an eclecticism and market a brand better than contrasting it with the adversaries? For right populism, self-defining enemy target is anything on the left, all of which are called socialism or communism. Ironically, for left populism self-branding, the most fervently opposed adversary is not the right populist, but a social democrat or a European parliamentarian. While right populists find their straw men in left populism, left populism does not even define right populism as its main adversary. There is a tremendously costly trade-off that emerges from left populism's entrance into the political dynamic field, and that's the necessary eclipse of the left-leaning substantive politics. This is so because right and left populists challenge the dominant form of politics and informal and effective identification with a leader figure becomes hegemonic. My final point was for the opposition in general, and it was about the essential eclecticism of right populist strategy. If the opposition in the left expects to find a consistently right-leaning narrative, economic policy, and coalition in right-leaning populism, it would be very much mistaken. 
right-leaning populists tend to forge a very broad coalition composed of very different groups that are eclectic in terms of class and cultural identity. They use racism as well as inclusion of minorities strategically. They can reshuffle and carve coalitions again and again, almost entirely, to keep the coalition partners who have very divergent interests together. Right-leaning populists are compelled, compelled to combine opposite forms of economic policy. They need to impose, on the one hand, tax cuts, tax immunities, deregulation, distribute public contracts, rent, but also, and also, will have to distribute social benefits and implement targeted policies that address some economically vulnerable groups. Hence, they combine neoliberal economic policies with economically populist ones. The opposition does not realize that right-leaning politics can be eclectic and keeps focusing on the nebulous concept it calls neoliberalism and imagines it everywhere and essentially misses the left populist meaning of the right populist strategy in relation to some groups. That is how it's possible for a radically right-leaning strategy, as the one in Turkey, to get experienced as a left-leaning populist from the perspective of its poorest clients who live on state subsidies. My example was Erdogan, and uh, all of these uh, points are drawn from Turkey's experience with Erdogan's uh, skills. To some, even uh, radical right populists are somebody's left populists. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Jean. Okay. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Is this on? Really? Is it on? It is on. Okay. Um, so, as those of you who have read my post or heard me present a version of this uh, talk at the Constellations Conference I organized last semester called Democracy in a World of Crisis, I do argue that left populism, like its right-wing nemesis, has an elective affinity with competitive authoritarianism, that's a concept, um, a version of authoritarian government that retains some of the trappings of democracy like elections, hoping to retain democratic legitimacy, while simultaneously eviscerating democracy as a political form and as a form of society. Left populism, in short, cannot avoid the authoritarianism inherent in the strategic logic of populism generally, despite the inclusionary and democratizing projects of the left movements it attaches to, and despite the liberal or democratic socialist rhetoric of left populist leaders and their organic intellectuals. I demonstrate this in a rather long and extensive post, which I think you all should read, um, uh, by um, examining the theoretical and political assumptions of moves populism theory, heavily dependent on Laclau's, uh, that has now spawned something called the Essex School, and by drawing on the lessons of really existing left populism and power, especially in Latin America, and we have an expert here with us, thank goodness. I show that left populism in principle involves a trade-off between inclusiveness, expansion of avenues for participation, solid, so, uh, solidarity, oh, solidaristic redistribution, that's the one side, versus the decline in the quality of the democracy, civil liberties, the rule of law, and clientelism one always slips into the other. In short, my claim is that left populism undermines the democratic institutions it aims to democratize and render more solidaristic. To show this, we, have to, we can't avoid developing an ideal type of populism. So I start with the elements of the ideal type that I and my co-author, and I have, a, we, oh, Andrew Arado, um, as we construct it, we have another piece on civil society and um, religion and populism, and he has an earlier piece, on, an excellent piece on Laclau. Anyway, we define populism as a discourse, a political strategy, a thin ideology, a political logic, and a style. I'm aware of the intense debate over different conceptual approaches to populism, variously labeled, discourse theoretic, that, theoretic that's Mufa Laclau, strategic, ditto, ideational, socioeconomic, stylistic, each of which prioritizes one dimension, and none of these is adequate, but if you select the relevant elements from each, you can construct an ideal type, which is illuminating and useful. I'm also aware that populism is a polemical and essentially contested concept, 
And yes, populism has begun to function as a counterconcept in Koselleck's terms, used to disqualify those associated with it through negative semantics. Nevertheless, this doesn't mean that a critical assessment of populist claims, strategic logic, and practices are ipso facto meant to discredit everything to the left of socialist democracy, as some argue, or actually serves to reinforce what populists rebel against, the status quo, unresponsive power elites, in short, post-democracy. No, it doesn't mean that. So, it doesn't, so we, these uses of it cannot relieve us of the obligation to develop a coherent ideal type that would help us critically assess and analyze the theories and practices that are labeled populist. So you, get, you can't get out of it. Populist discourse, so here, we, here it is, the ideal type. Populist discourse pits the people against the establishment, evoking um, their need to recuperate their populist sovereignty from usurpers. So as such, it's a thin ideology based on the appeal of us versus them involving anti-establishment anti rhetoric, anti-status quo stances, and redemptive Manichaean framing as a strategy. This is the Mufal Cow stuff. The aim is to create a unified collective subject, the people, with a collective will by erecting the chain of equivalences among heterogeneous demands around a he hegemonic signifier, you know the drill, articulated by a leader with whom they identify and who embodies their will. This entails constructing a frontier between us and them, but the them is never only the establishment or the so-called oligarchy. It invariably includes parts of the population unallied with the populist party movement who may be stigmatized as outsiders or undeservedly privileged as, um, or, or deemed privileged population segments. The strategic goal is to attain and maintain political power electorally based on mass mobilization of heterogeneous strata around a unitary collective identity. The leader, um, emphasizes direct, unmediated, personalistic linkages to the base um, constructed as the people. While social, and I've written a lot on social movements, while social movement mobilization, deploying some populist rhetoric and tropes may emerge autonomously in civil society and prioritize horizontal participation, inclusion, social rights, that doesn't make them populist necessarily. But they can morph into populist party movements. We can talk about what that means. Um, electoral vehicles when a top-down mobilization strategy is superimposed on them by a leader who begins to emphasize personalistic and plebiscitarian elements to broaden his appeal. We've seen that with Morales in um, Latin America. Populism's political logic entails the construction of opposed identities and political polarization. It also involves a pars pro total logic that extracts the true people, the authentic majority, the real sovereign from the rest of the population and from the elites. It, inv it is invariably linked, despite Mouffe's disclaimers, to a friend-enemy conception of the politics. That never bothered La Clau, but it bothers her. As a style, population, uh, populism, whoops, involves the performative act enactment of the habitus of the people, the ordinary folk, um, by political leaders claiming to incarnate their unity and identity. Populist leaders are able to pose, therefore, as the opposition and invade against the establishment, even when they're in power, always warning against some deep plot requiring vigilance and ever-expanding discretionary and ultimately permanent political power. The populist leader refuses differentiation of the party, the movement, and the state when in power and rejects the principle of self-limitation regarding institutions, um, majorities, other parties, and other social movements. Populists in power always exhibit hostility to the institutions of counter-democracy. Their aim is to remain there in power. Hence, their eagerness to do constitutional reform, uh, targeting institutions that might allow opponents to win office or limit executive power and invoking the people's will and welfare as justification. And they depend on a host ideology, this is important, on a host ideology for content and moral substance because populism is not a specific ideology and the people is not a specific class or a social category, it's a floating signifier. The latter feature allows populists, allows theorists to speak of left and right populism, that's why you can talk about both of them, it's also why they can ally. Um, and you're right, Aishan is right about that. It's also why populist leaders are opportunistic, embracing a shifting range of programmatic and policy positions. Um, 
So if, as Mouffe insists, populism, populism is au fond a strategy for gaining power, of course the host ideologies are expendable. So we see examples of left and right unity in Italy of populists. Anyway, so what is left populism? Well, I focus on Mouffe's version. She construes it with respect to what it criticizes, i.e. right-wing populism, post-democracy, and in terms of the strategy of con constituting both sides of the frontier. Um, as I noted in my post, left populists are correct. Contemporary populism in Europe and the US, I restrict myself to that area, um, is partly a response to the crisis of neoliberal hyperglobalist hegemony, the deregulatory austerity politics that established parties championed, and the democratic and solidarity deficits these entail. They also rightly fault the failure of once progressive political parties to be receptive to the needs and demands triggered by these policies and their inability or unwillingness to represent them politically. The proliferation of populist party movements and the electoral successes of populist leaders both signals and exacerbates the crisis of political representation and the weakness of established political parties. But populism is the wrong solution to this problem. MOVE purports to give a theoretical explanation of post-democracy that is linked to deep paradoxes allegedly inherent in liberal democracy generally. And in my post, I describe her continued reliance on Schmidian assumptions regarding the relation between political liberalism and democracy, and I show the contradictions in her overall approach. I discuss the ideological core of this problematic, the equality difference dichotomy, uh, which is a category mistake, and we can talk about it. It's a category mistake. There is no equality difference dichotomy. Um, uh, that she buys into from Schmidt and the contradiction she falls into in refusing to see that liberal de democracy is a palimpsest. I can't even say that word. They go together. Uh, and that far from there being a deep constitutive tension between rights and democracy, liberal and democratic constitutionalism, it is rather illiberal democracy that's the contradiction in terms. Um, so uh, let me now turn, uh, and I end, with the elective affinity. I mean, there's much, it's complicated, but I end with the elective affinity um, between um, uh, uh, populism and uh, left populism and authoritarianism. I, it's sort of obvious from everything I said anyway, but I'll, I'll go into it. So um, uh, the problem is that most populist commitments conflict with the host ideologies she endorses, namely democracy. She even embraces liberal democracy, weirdly enough, given her critique, and liberal socialism. Um, for her, left as opposed to right populism is a, an inclusive instead of an exclusive form of identity politics. So it does not draw the frontier between the people and the elites in racist, xenophobic, nationalistic terms, but it draws it between the authentic people and the oligarchs. Um, and it, the aim is to radicalize democracy and make it solidary. But you already know what I think about that. Nevertheless, in addition, there are five features of left populist discourse embraced by MOVE that conflict with the problem, with the, di with the uh, project of defending and expanding democracy um, within the frame of liberal and democratic democracy and socialism, which is her frame. First, there's the embodiment model of the leader the pars and the pars pro total logic, the part of the people that is the whole. So uh, the problem is not that a charismatic leader gets people off the ground and mobilizes them. The charisma of the leader is not the problem. Mandela was pretty charismatic, charismatic, no? Remember Mandela? But he was not a populist. He refused the populist temptation. He said no. The problem is the embodiment model of the leader. I incarnate. I construct, La Clau, and I incarnate the people and their will. That's the problem. OK. Populist politics is identity politics, left and right, aimed at dividing society into two ca camps, and uh, into what the political scientists call, after all, I'm supposed to be one, effective party political polarization. Effective party political polarization, um, which does map on pretty quickly to friend-enemy politics. It blocks compromise, it blocks, you don't discuss across the frontier, so. Populist anti-establishment stance and anti-institutional stance fosters the bypassing and hollowing out of established political parties and the refusal to develop um, well-organized party structures and party discipline because they want to have a so-called direct, it's never direct, but they pretend to have a so-called direct link to the people. We're doing participatory stuff, so let's have some plebiscites. Um, and this fosters personalistic politics 
and ultimately clientelism. The socialist redistributive line turns into clientelism. Populists in power reject the separation of powers and all and the legitimacy of other parties and civil associations. They have to. How can more than one party or association represent the people? And if there are the parties out there saying, hey, we're the people too, that delegitimizes the populist stance of incarnating and structuring the people. So there's some issues here. Okay. Um, so and populism does draw on the democratic imaginary. It um, undermines, however, the ver very democratic institutions that left populism claims to be including the excluded groups into. It's a slight problem. And finally, uh, one ha I don't think Bernie Sanders is a populist, but I don't care either. But I, I don't think he is because um, I, I, I don't think that he had that incarnation model. I don't think there was the pause pro total logic, whatever. I mean, in other words, populist talk, we have to distinguish between movements that have some, every, every political party claims to represent the people. It doesn't make them populist. We have to distinguish between movements, party movements, uh, populist um, governments, and populist regimes. They are not all the same thing. It's a spectrum. Once you get to a populist regime, we're in deep trouble, as the case of Turkey revealed. Thank you. Thank you, Jean. Did you, would you take the mic, please? Oh, sorry. Thanks. Oh. Thank you. So thank you, Bernard, for your uh, invitation. Uh, I'm the only one at this table uh, not to have written on populism. Perhaps I'm invited because uh, being a physician, I can treat these uh, and diagnose and, and treat this political pathology. Uh, but I, I will start uh, to uh, by briefly tell you what I understood uh, before making three uh, remarks. So Chantal Mouffe builds her manifesto for a left populism on a relatively straightforward political diagnosis, diagnosis in four steps. First, we are living through a populist moment, populism being defined as a discursive strategy opposing the elite and the people. It's, it is not an ideology, and it can accommodate to various institutional frameworks. Second, this moment results from the crisis of the neoliberal hegemonic formation, which had itself replaced the social democratic welfare state in the 1980s. This crisis corresponds to the disarticulation of liberal principles of freedom and the rule of law from democratic principles of equality and sovereignty of the people, the former remaining alone after the elimination of the latter, which led to what she calls the current post-democracy. Third, the left has committed, has committed two historical errors. Initially, it, its uh, class essentialism has made it impervious to the emergence of new social movements, including ra involving race, gender, uh, sexuality, and environment. And later, its attempt to propose a third way that would create a consensus at the center generated a post-politics, uh, which did not leave space for contradictions and conflict. Fourth, the combination of the post-democracy, decline of social justice and distrust of, in representation, and of post-politics, extinction of the left-right opposition, paved the way to populism as the only alternative to neoliberalism and response to people's discount, QED. So based on this diagnosis, uh, MOVE draws a plan for, for the left. Paradoxically, uh, Margaret Thatcher serves as her model. Uh, she conquered po power by using populist arguments, opposing an oppressive establishment of the state and the, and the unions, and the industrious people which did not receive the benefits of its labor. But once in power, she developed a classical form of authoritarian neoliberalism, which not only allowed her to develop her Hayekian political project, but was, all, but was later adopted by her successors under the, the edges of Tony Blair. Populism was therefore a stepping stone to impose a hegemonic model. And for her, this is what the left should in turn do, but with, for, but with for objective, the advent of a new hegemony reuniting liberalism and democracy, in other words. Populism must serve as a short-term tactic for long-term strategy. She sees Jeremy Corbyn as the best example of the successful application of this winning scheme as he adopted the same position as them. 
More generally, in our view, populism is the means, radical democracy, which supposes pluralism and representation, the ends. But for populism to exist, there has to be a people, and being anti-essentialist, that's what she says, Mouffe proposes to construct it. Whereas a few decades ago, the left was fo exclusively focused on the working class, ignoring the new social movements, the opposite can be said today, and the left consequently needs to retrieve the social question while not losing sight of the cause of ethno-racial minorities, feminists, immigrants, and the environment. But it must, it must not do so in an horizontal way. The people must be represented in its plurality, supposedly, and it shall have a leader, though not authoritarian. Finally, the struggles should not be global. They, are, they need a national frame in which affective identifications are crucial to populism, uh, in which um, affective identifications that are crucial to populism can occur. This is the outline, as I understand it, of the diagnosis and project proposed by Chantal Mouffe. Although the examples that she provides mostly come from the European context, I would argue that the type of left populism she calls for in her essay is profoundly influenced by her late husband's national background. Like the great majority of leftist intellectuals in Argentina, Ernesto Laclau was a Kirchner Kirchnerista, that is, a supporter and even informal advisor of Nestor, Nestor and later Christina Kirchner, the most recent reincarnations of Peronism. For him, the Kirchners epitomized left populism with personalized charismatic leadership, vertical political or, uh, organization, broad popular support, anti-establishment rhetoric, nationalist discourse. But he also regarded as a welcome alternative to the expansion of an aggressive and predatory neoliberalism in Latin America, the coming to power of Hugo Chavez in Venezuela, Evo Morales in Bolivia, Rafael Correa in Ecuador, and uh, in all these cases, thanks to the mobilization of grassroots organizations, peasants, communities, and the working class. For Laclau, these countries showed that left populism could succeed, leading to the election of progressive leaders. The fact that MOUF does not mention any of these populist leaders who have inspired Laclau's 2005 theoretical book on populist reason is, I think, revealing. Probably the deteriorated image of Chavez, the hold on power of Morales, the authoritarian style of Correa, the corruption scandal surrounding Christina Kirchner, demonstrated that the passage from the conquest of power to the mode of governing evoked by Bernard in his introduction poses complex questions, although a thorough analysis of their action could give a more balanced assessment recognizing some achievements in terms of reduction of inequality and Ill illiteracy, for, for instance. But obviously, MOUF prefers to discuss European countries where left populism uh, is still relatively immaculate for never having exercised responsibilities, with the only exception of Syriza, whose alliance with ANEL, the right-wing populist party since 2015, she surprisingly forgets to evoke. Indeed, neither the Labour Party nor Podemos, or the, the present Labour Party, nor Podemos, nor Die Linke, nor uh, La France Insoumise, in as much as these parties should be characterized as left populist, have governed. In this respect, Mouffe's affirmation that La France Insoumise represents the main opposition to the government of Emmanuel Macron is somewhat optimistic in our view, as opinion polls for the European election in May show that uh, with less than 10% of voting intentions, that is lev less than half of the percentage of Marine Le Pen's Rassemblement National, the party comes in fifth position. Thus, examining attentively and seriously the experiences of left populism conducted in Latin America, so often caricatured, could be a good starting point. But to return to the two sides of Mouffe's argument, the diagnosis and the project, I will limit my comment to one point on each of them. So part of the diagnosis, if not original, can be considered to be accurate. The general shift to the right of the polit political spectrum, the delegitimation of the ideas of the left, 
the blurring of the dividing ideological lines, the hegemony of neoliberalism. I would, however, argue that the decline of democratic, uh, against her, that the decline of democratic life is also accompanying, accompanied by a decline of liberal principles. Not only is inequality growing and popular sovereignty waning, but freedom and the rule of law are threatened by law and order policies, securitization, and surveillance. But my main point is different. I do not think that present right-wing populism is a response to a crisis of neoliberalism, first because it is not a response, and second because there is no such crisis. On the contrary, right-wing populism is often a Trojan horse for neoliberalism. Examples abound, but one should suffice. The coming to power of Donald Trump is an elect electoral victory for populism, but a political victory for neoliberalism. The grotesque figure of the president, that is the unsettling combination of ridiculous and odious, of absurd and obscene, which attracts so effectively the attention of the media and the public, allows his political allies and rich donors to discreetly uh, get their neoliberal agenda through. Tax cuts for corporations and the wealthy, budget reduction for social and health programs, deregulation of finance, consumer protection, and environmental pr preservation, among other decisions less discussed than the president's tweets. I've, these have largely benefited the upper segment of the population while contributing to the increase of economic disparities. This triumph, triumph of neoliberalism has been interpreted by some as a typical example of false consciousness since the blue-collar workers who succumbed to the uh, populist candidate Sirens and voted for him were among those directly affected by his reforms. Yet, it would be, it would be more interesting to note two facts. First, exit polls of the presidential election indicate that the percentage of vote in favor of Trump was much higher among the well-off than among the low-income households. And second, international comparison established that the abstention rate, which is always higher among the poor, increases with inequality, the United States having therefore one of the lowest turnouts of Western countries. In other words, it would be more accurate, rather than speaking of false consciousness, to speak of the enlightened consciousness of the more privileged who vote for the candidate whose policy will benefit them not only directly via his decisions, but also indirectly by affecting the abstention rate of the lower social segments. Now, regarding the project, even if one accepts the idea that left populism is the lifeline of the left, it is revealing that a somewhat old, of a somewhat old conception of democracy and of the people as it leaves little space to participative democracy and to people's say. First, in Mouffe's vision, the envisaged democ democracy is representative and mostly vertical with the dominant figure of the leader. In the case of La France Insoumise, if it is indisputable that Jean-Luc Mélenchon's talent of populist tribu tribune uh, explain in good part the initial success of the movement, there is little doubt that its rapid decline after the presidential election has been largely facilitated by his bullish personality. You have to remember that he, a few weeks ago he uh, uh, said, my person is sacred. The contrast between the quality of the debate inside the party and intellectual openness of its member and the simplified messages and dogmatic discourse of the leader is striking. It is more than an uh, idiosyncrasy, it derives from the very populist idea of the supreme leader. And second, in Mouffe's program, the imagined people does not seem to have a voice. It is rather spoken via the leader. People are supposed to be affected emotionally by discourses, images, mobilizations, but they are more on the receiving end than on the emitting side. They are represented than, rather than they represent themselves. Although she cites the indignados three times in passing and even quotes uh, there, we have a vote but we have no voice, she does not refer to any such movement when she analyzes what she calls the contraction of the people. 
Indeed, the people is constructed, it does not seem to construct itself. Significantly, the attitude of the French left parties and trade unions to the Gilets Jaunes movement, undoubtedly populist and popular, composed of working class and low middle class, has been at the beginning prudent, if not reluctant, as protesters were depicted by the government and journalists as pujadist, xenophobic, anti-Semitic. Among the numerous interesting aspects of this almost entirely spontaneous uprising, which long refused leaders, two may, retained, uh, may be retained for our topic. The first lesson is that the two supposedly populist parties have apparently not taken advantage of the situation. The Rassemblement National has remained stab stable in terms of voting intention around 21-22%. The France Insoumise has even declined from 11-12 to 8-9%. And the presidential party has slightly progressed from 19 to 22%. In sum, no benefit of the populist uprising for left, left populism. The second lesson is that on the roundabouts and in the street, it seems that attempts of political exploitation, in particular by the far right, have failed, and that on the contrary, right and left populists often decided to leave aside their ideological differences and to fraternize against their common enemies, which interestingly was the state rather than the capital. In sum, on the ground, the right-left division seemed to ease somewhat. So my more general point is that it is crucial to acknowledge and pay attention to actual movements, even when they do not fall into the theorists' categories. Earlier, I used the formulation, even if one accepts the idea that left populism is the lifeline of the left, I simply want to add that I'm not of those who accept this idea. Suffice to observe the problematic evolution of Die Linke with uh, Sarah Wagenknecht. I believe that the left does not need populism. Instead, it needs two things, at least, that are definitely missing in many contexts, that of France in particular, ideas and courage. Thank you. All right. Jan. I fear this is a real case of um, everything has been said, but not everybody has said it. <laughs> so especially since I very much agree with the more theoretical points that uh, Sheila and Jean have put before us, I want to propose a perhaps somewhat more sympathetic or at least imminent reading of this book also in the hope of generating something perhaps more constructive by way of also reading some parts of the book against the grain. And I'll make two major points in this, in this context. The first one is that it seems to me one can actually separate two of the main arguments that Chantal Mouffe makes, or perhaps another way of putting this, one can separate an earlier incarnation of Mouffe from a contemporary one. What do I mean? On the one hand, there is her long-standing argument that the third way, the kind of move to an allegedly reasonable center from which there is no legitimate dissent or disagreement, remains, it seems to me, an important insight, especially for our day, because as you probably will all agree, our great savior from populism, namely Emmanuel Macron, seems very much like a second coming of the third way. If not, if one wants to dig a bit deeper in the history of political thought, of someone like Guizot, because it almost seems it's another incarnation of the idea of a sovereignty of reason, with which basically no reasonable person, except the extremes, the unreasonable extremes, on the left and the right can disagree. So it seems to me this remains an important insight and remains also especially important as undoubtedly in this country, we will see a discussion where those who say we must go back to a reasonable or perhaps put less politely technocratic center is the most important thing is gonna heat up over the next year or so. 
But this diagnosis, it seems to me, can really be separated from the claim that somehow populism is the best answer to address this issue. More particularly within the oeuvre of, of Chantal Mouffe, the claim that somehow the earlier work on regaining cultural hegemony is somehow not enough, it needs to be populism, it needs to be people talk that gives us the solution. And as she herself says in the book, this is a strategic point, it's strategic advice, but another way of putting this point is to say, well, it's a kind of empirical hypothesis. It's a kind of claim in the realm of instrumental reason. If you do this, you're going to get the right results. Now, it would be silly to claim that you know, one or two elections can disprove a theory. But one or two elections that have been run precisely on the basis of this theory might also not be entirely irrelevant for a discussion like this. So if we just look at a case that has already been, been mentioned by Didier a minute ago, surely it's relevant, and here, as some of you will realize, I'm basically just paraphrasing the analysis of Eric Fassin, it's surely relevant that Jean-Luc Mélenchon shifted rather dramatically from his 2012 campaign, which featured very universalist language, which talked about you know, peoples or even a people around the Mediterranean, where everybody who drowns is our concern, because after all, we are also, as France, the universalist nation, to shift from that to the 2017 rhetoric, which was much more people-centric, where the red flag was replaced by the Tricolore, where the international was replaced by the Marseillaise, and where, of course, La France en Simouise did very well. Except, at least according to some, some, uh, some empirical investigations, only about 3% switched from what was then still the Front National to Mélenchon. Now, one conclusion one can draw from this is that somehow it wasn't national enough. And it seems to me this is de facto the lesson that another movement that has already been mentioned, the Wagenknechts Aufstehen, Stand Up, has de facto drawn. As far as I understand it, the only truly distinctive feature of Aufstehen is its opposition to open borders. Nothing else really distinguishes it from the left party or certain sections of the Social Democrats. Now again, it's an empirical question, but I would venture that no matter how much they move further towards nationalism, every single time that the latest incarnation of proper left-wing populism arrives at the doorstep of Didier Eribon's mother, she may still vote for the far right. Because as we all know, once certain identifications have been put into place, they can be very hard to dislodge. But that's not the only problem. The other problem is, of course, that in the process of this kind of nationalization, it's very likely that the parameters of discussion, which the far right in some countries has put in place, are going to be further strengthened. And the irony of this entire story, as many critics of MOVE has also pointed out, is that the disappointment that is so often then inherent in the fact that Didier Eribon's mother yet again doesn't vote for the left populist can only be a disappointment from a certain point of view, a certain position that, alas, has to be characterized as class essentialism. Because after all, the assumption is these workers must w vote for a leftist party given their position. And as you all know, it's exactly this class essentialism which Laclau and Mouffe back in the day had so effectively refuted. Second, second brief point. As has also already been mentioned in this book, somewhat surprisingly, there is a chapter called Learning from Thatcherism, when I think many of us would have preferred a chapter that had been entitled Learning from Mélenchon, from Podemos, from Syriza. After all, she herself has been advising these campaigns. I think many of us would have loved an account of how they discuss things, what the strategic considerations were, and so on and so forth. And instead, we get a chapter that, of course, is full of almost boundless admiration for Thatcher and, and Thatcherism. 
And the argument, as DD has already mentioned, is that this is partly important even now because it's an example of how the wrong kind of populism succeeded. Now, of course, there is a long-standing argument that Thatcherism was a form of authoritarian populism. But it's not quite so obvious, to me at least, that this is the best frame to make sense of it. Above all, it was a very successful form of establishing cultural hegemony, especially at the level of articulating and disarticulating ideas. Many of you will remember this possibly apocryphal story where already in the 70s, Margaret Thatcher at a Tory party conference, after all, you know, after all the wets have been going on and on about something, finally stands up, bangs the famous handbag on the table, and also finally reveals what's in the handbag. You remember, she pulls out Hayek's Constitution of Liberty and supposedly tells them, this is what we believe. And that also already goes to show that it wasn't first populism and then hegemony. No. First, it was a set of very substantial, very sophisticated ideas, something that I sometimes feel some people on the left are still not quite willing to acknowledge because they use cliches like, oh, market fundamentalism, neoliberalism is all about, you know, greed is good, and so on, as opposed to basically acknowledging that it was a very substantive set of ideas, including moral ideas, which resonate in a particular way, which is not to say it's correct or attractive or anything, but one has to understand how strong that enemy is to really effectively combat it. So against that background, I was also puzzled by her claim in the end that she says, look, I'm not basically telling you anything about principles, ideas, any substantive proposals. Every single country, every single movement in every single nation is gonna have to work this out for themselves. That strikes me as deeply implausible because it precisely fails to take on the lesson of neoliberalism, which is it's an international movement. Of course it has to be adapted to local circumstance. That's trivial. But it was a substantive set of ideas that spread eventually in a, in a global fashion. And to entirely leave that dimension out and say, oh, it's simply about strategy. And as long as you do a certain kind of people talk, you have a good chance of winning just seems deeply dissatisfying. And I wish she had written a different book, or maybe is gonna give us a different book, which really will reflect more on these, on these recent experiences, and partly tell the inside story, but also actually not get that prehistory of neoliberalism and of whatever post-neoliberalism might possibly look like so fundamentally wrong. Thank you. Thank you, Jan. So uh, let me make a few comments about the papers and the interventions uh, before then opening it up to uh, other, other comments and, and perspectives. Um, I, I, the, both the uh, papers on the website and these presentations have been uh, remarkable uh, and uh, their conversation is really uh, important. Now, I do sense, though, that they offer kind of an object lesson in nominalism, in the difficulty of applying an abstract label to phenomena that are inextricably really existing singularities in history. And in part, I think that the, the problem, the kind of the nominalist trap, comes from the initial move away from a simple definition of populism as simply an appeal, a discursive appeal to we the people. Um, which I think to a certain extent, um, Jan, in your book, What is Populism? That's the, the, the kind of foundational move is to say populism is not just this discursive appeal to uh, we the people, it's not just an anti-elitism, right? But it's, it's something more, uh, it, and it has these tendencies. Um, it's the move away from Chantal Mouffe's original 
position of an anti-essentialist, discursive, constructive conception of populism. Now, I think that the minute we go beyond that basic minimalist description of what populism is, and we begin to ascribe to the term populism certain characteristics, such as leadership, uh, such as exclusivity, or antagonism, or a Schmittian friend-enemy uh, dichotomy, the minute we start kind of layering on those qualities onto the notion of a we the people discursive approach to politics, I think we fall in the nominalist trap. I think, we, I think it becomes clear that, um, uh, uh, at least the nominalist trap, to be, to, to be clear, the idea uh, that nominalism tries to address by favoring the study of historical singularities over the naming of phenomena. So what this makes me think is that we really need to start with uh, a disambiguation of the term populism. Uh, and, and on your seats, I, I left you this uh, uh, proposed populism disambiguation uh, entry. Uh, it's not a Wikipedia entry. But I thought that it would be perfect to actually use the format of uh, the Wikipedia disambiguate uh, pages. You know those pages where you're looking for a word and it gives you the, uh, the options, right? Uh, I wrote this. Uh, it's, it won't be on Wikipedia, um, but it is in some sense a kind of a reaction and incorporates, I think, the interventions, um, uh, including uh, Didier Fassin's intervention, which I wasn't sure uh, what you were going to say, Didier, but it turns out that you would fall, I think, into the populism false ideology category, uh, or kind of like populism as hypocrisy. Um, but uh, so let me propose here this way of, of uh, maybe disambiguating what we mean when we talk about populism. There is the minimalist description, which is simply the fact that there's an appeal to the we the people. Uh, to a certain extent, I think that, Asian, that is part of your, and you do this beautiful job of distinguishing between two definitions of populism, but I think that is part of your way of thinking of, sub, of an existentially left populism, simply, there. Um, and, of course, that's the popular definition of populism that I think, uh, Jan, you re reject. Um, now, there is, of course, these distinctions between populism as a social movement versus populism in power, which are central to many of our conversations. And I think, Jean, that's central to your distinctions between you know, what, what happens when populism becomes a regime. Um, but it's also Nadia Urb Urbinati, uh, who is uh, also abroad um, in her essay, uh, uses that distinction importantly. There is the populism authoritarianism, whereby populism is necessarily authoritarian, right? And, and I, think that that's, I think that's the position uh, this evening. Uh, uh, Shayla, I think you're taking that position, that there is a necessity to it. Uh, Jean as well. Uh, now, not Jan in tonight's presentation, but in, the, in your book, um, What is Populism? And Federico, possibly you're heading there, I sense, from your post, but I'll, I'll, I'll turn it over to you in a minute. Then there's this idea of populism as hypocritical, right? It's a, a cover. It's a cover for, in this case, neoliberalism. Trump is actually not representing the people. It's just a, a ploy uh, that allows. And then there are others. I mean, there's populism in so many of the regimes from Latin America. I mean, I think we would have a special category for Latin American post-World War II populist regimes um, when we're talking. Now, what I would suggest is that uh, if we use this language more carefully, then I think we'd be better able to understand each other and also uh, better able to articulate our arguments. Now, what I'd like, what I would argue is that it's possible to have a populist social movement uh, like Bernie Sanders that does not necessarily tend toward authoritarianism. Or for that matter, a populist, uh, populism social movement like Occupy Wall Street that doesn't necessarily favor a leader. Now, the notion of the 
in Occupy, I think, is a fundamentally populist notion um, against the 1% elite. But it doesn't have a leader. I, I actually think that certain expressions of the Yellow Vest movement have a certain populism to them today, equally opposed to notions of leader, leaders. Uh, and any time any French, Yellow Vest uh, French person becomes a leader, they're immediately, their head is cut off. Now, um, as a nominalist myself, I'm not sure necessarily that we should retain the use of this term, populist, so I'll, I'll put that on the table. But if we do, um, it strikes me uh, that we, we, sh we maybe should recuperate a narrow definition of populism, the first, minimalist description. Um, and then, of course, the question becomes more empirical, and in this sense, I, I think I agree, Jan, that the questions become more empirical rather than abstract theoretical. Uh, the question of whether populism as a minimalist description uh, becomes uh, authoritarian or anti-pluralist uh, is an empirical and a historical claim uh, that's going to raise questions like what are the, what are the additional attributes or variables that tend to push populism into its uh, autocratic direction, right? Leader, leader, leaderness, leaderfulness perhaps, a strong leader might be one variable that would push this discourse. And, and or questions like what's the appeal to the people? Has it been successful on the left? And then of course we would ask these questions about la France insoumise, et cetera. But I do think, but I do think then that um, it, it, is a, it could be a useful device to distinguish certain forms of political discourse from others. If you think, for instance, of François Mitterrand's uh, uh, campaign, uh, when François Mitterrand took the position that he was opposed to the death penalty, uh, it was not a populist position. I mean, it was, not a, he, it was not a populist appeal. He specifically said, I understand that the French people are in favor of the death penalty, but he said, I have an ethical, personal opposition, and you should know, if you vote for me, I'm gonna get rid of the death penalty. The French people might be in favor of it, I understand that, but that's not my position, right? Now, it seems that, that, is, that that's an important distinction uh, from someone else using a, a rhetorical style, like Bernie Sanders, or possibly Chantal Mouffe, in a non-essentialist way uh, of the people, to distinguish certain political formations. I don't think that the people necessarily means the Volk, uh, C. Sanders. Uh, I don't think that it necessarily means leadership, uh, C. Occupy, uh, but it may be possibly a useful category uh, in, a dis in, in terms of, in, in the way in which uh, Chantal Mouffe narrowly defines it um, in this uh, first a disambiguated sense. All right, and it also may not need, mean no program, no rational program. Again, if you look at Bernie Sanders' book, it's all about what the American people want, uh, but it's a loaded political program, page after page, essentially, of senatorial suggestions about what kind of bills should be introduced uh, to transform America. Uh, okay, so um, uh, let me let me stop there and uh, open it up, and maybe I'll pass the mic first to Federico. Sure. Yeah, and make sure it's on on the top. Yeah, I would like to. Uh, I mean, I recently had a conversation. Uh, can you hear? I think it's on, eh? I think it's on. Okay, so... Just put it closer to you and, and speak louder, yeah. Okay. Now? Yes? 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 Okay. So I recently had a conversation which remind me of uh, conversations that I had with my grandfather, who, who in fact, escaping from anti-Semitism in Europe, uh, he wanted to come to Argentina, which is my country, I'm a citizen of Argentina, uh, and basically, Argentina at that time, in the 1930s, had racist policies such as the one we have now in the U.S., and he was not welcome, uh, so he went to Uruguay and he took 
uh, a illegally about, and he was an undocumented immigrant in Argentina for decades, and, and, I'm, and because of that, I'm a citizen of that country. Um, now, he was obsessed always asking this question, which is not specific to him. I mean, and whatever political situation happened in Argentina, he will ask, and you know, we would have this funny conversation because I did not share his concern in such a way as it was presented, but every question was, is it good for the Jews? Uh, and, 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 I, and I remember this because I was talking with an, old, uh, an older you know, man than I am, remind me of my grandfather, and this person was obsessed whether Donald Trump was an anti-Semite or not, and basically, I told him, look, I'm, uh, I, you know, I have many hats. I'm an historian of fascism and populism. I also consider myself to be an historian of anti-Semitism. And in a way, the question doesn't matter, because even if he's an anti-Semite or not, in history, whenever a racist was in power, it was never good for the Jews. So the question that, in a way, uh, I, I think historically would like to ask uh, you know, Chantal Mouffe is, I mean, whether when populism, either left or right, was in power, whether it was good for democracy. Of course, the answer is not as easy as the question of racism and the fate of minorities. Uh, because historically, uh, one of the paradoxes of populism, and historically, I mean, it is in Latin America, for whether it's good or not, it's a normative position, that we have all these experiences throughout the decades with populism in power. And, uh, and one of the paradoxes was that at the same time that often democracy was increased in social terms, in terms of political participation, for example, Peronism basically at one point decided that women could vote, meaning that was quite an enlargement of, you know, of, uh, of democracy in many ways. Uh, and yet it also came with a kind of authoritarian package. So increasingly I'm going there, I mean, I believe I always have been there, like in, there, in terms of noting this paradox, that often when, uh, when even when, when it happens that democracy is enlarged, at the same time it is reduced because there is a people that are not considered to be members of the people. Uh, and actually were members of the people before or are, or are even members of the people legally. So this is an issue that I think uh, 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 Chantal Mouffe decides to ignore. And this, uh, this act of, I mean, in, in such a political intervention is quite disingenuous. Because in fact, this is the same, I mean, she was trained as a specialist on South America. Uh, so she knows Latin American history very well. And not only that, I mean, of course, there is the issue of uh, the Essex School and the work of Laclau uh, with, with Jean um, have, 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 had emphasized. But, but then, seven years ago, I noticed this in, my, in, my, you know, in the piece that I wrote for, for your blog, seven years ago, Chantal Mouffe was calling for a Latinoamericanization of Europe. And he meant by that, basically, the populism of the left that at that, that, at that time she liked uh, in Latin America. And we should remember that the Schmidt is very important. I think it's central. I mean, because we should remember that, in fact, uh, there was not such a, a kind of 100% identification between Laclau and the Kirchners. In fact, he criticized the Kirchners because according to Laclau, they were not polarizing enough and there was not really for him such a demarcation of an internal frontier between the people and them. So actually he praised Chavez and he said Chavez in a way that is, is better than Nestor because Chavez is really providing the, that demarcation. Now historically we see where that went, I mean the current situation in, in Venezuela. So the question here is that why not asking the historical question in a political intervention? And this is a question that, that I think I would like to ask as an historian because, you, because probably including history in this will probably lead to a more critical and even self-critical take of what a left populism should be. Because again, like we all have normative positions here and by default, I should not say that this is a problem. Depending on who you are, you might think this is actually fantastic or not. Uh, but, in, but in a way, leaving history aside always poses a problem because it creates stereotypes and relying on leftist politics in terms of a stereotype is very problematic. So at one point she says that, I mean, an important point in the book is, you know, that this is a book against essentialism. And yet Europe, and especially Latin America, are deeply essentialized, either to be ignored or to be presented as the way to go. Now, historically, there are important links between Podemos and Latin America. Errejón, who co-wrote a book uh, with Chantal Mouffe, actually will be defined, you know, before they became enemies themselves, Iglesias will, will denominate 
will name Errejón as the Peronist among us, because there is a deep admiration for Peronism and the model of the Kirchner. So, I mean, there are so many things here that, 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 is, I, mean, that I really don't understand, or I'm confused, let's, say, let's put this, this diplomatically. I'm confused about why that, this will be the case. And the last two things I would like to mention, uh, is, uh, basically, it's not that I thought about them in my comments, but basically were suggested by the speakers, um, which is this idea of, uh, uh, let's say, this lack of allergy that Sheila Benavid was you know, most mentioning, this lack of allergy towards nationalism. And, and a left that somehow wants to engage in nationalism uh, is a left that somehow renounces an important dimension of the left, which is internationalism. And at the same time, it ignores, and this is something that Jarl Werner mentioned, ignores the international and even transnational dimension of the current populisms. And by the way, I'm writing on this now, Perón himself was trying to create a populist international back in the day. Chavez did the same. And this, this is always an international of the right. So why ignoring that? I mean, it's an issue that, that, is a, that can always be problematic. And the last thing I would like to say is that in the bibliography, it's kind of curious that it's really a dialogue. And this is something that, again, Jan Bernard mentioned in the sense of going back and thinking how much this relates or unrelates to the, particularly the work of Laclau, but also her own work. Because, in fact, it's a dialogue within a, within a certain tradition in the context of what it is for, you know, for, I mean, I don't know if it's good or not, an explosion of populism studies. But actually, these studies started a long time ago, for example, with Gino Germani, who actually, like was discussing with Gino Germani. So, basically, in terms of decades of research on this, there is no single mention of this bibliography. And, and then, I mean, I understand this is a political intervention. Editors would not like footnotes, but there are lot, lots of footnotes about a particular, I mean, about the SX school. So this is very problematic in, in terms of basically not really wanting a dialogue between, uh, you know, a lot of interpreters of the phenomenon. So I, I will stop there. Okay. Thank you, Federico. Um, Jason Frank. Uh, my comments are actually going to resonate with some of the things, and they're going to be very brief, uh, that, that uh, Bernard has already mentioned. I'm, I'm very skeptical of the prevailing discourse on populism and democratic decline, and for a number of reasons. For one thing, I think that focusing on populism as the primary source of democratic decline ends up obscuring the economic and political developments that have arguably most profoundly undermined democratic institutions and the meaning of democratic citizenship over the past 40 years. That is the more enduring and structural sources of democratic decline that I think Chantal Mouffe is right to say that these movements of popular authoritarianism have largely emerged in response to, although I agree with Didier, that doesn't necessarily mean that they are anti-neoliberal. You can have authoritarian neoliberal popular uh, politics, as, as Trump clearly indicates. So in this sense, I agree with Mouffe that the charge of populism, this is not exactly how she puts it, but it's, it's there, I think, in her argument, often tells us just as much about those making the charge as it does about their opponents. And that in contemporary political contexts, the widely recognized ambiguity of the term that everybody that writes about populism uh, discusses assumes a very clear polemical meaning when it is articulated from the embattled position of a once hegemonic liberalism. Um, and I also agree with her that the politics that are mobilized against this hollowing out of democracy could, in some meaningful way, be described as populism. But there the disagreements emerge. I think that Mouffe shares a conception of populism that remains invested in some of the same questionable presuppositions held about that category by some of her most eloquent critics, including uh, some of them that we have heard from tonight. I think one of the central, but I also think at times under-argued or under-elaborated presuppositions, and this is what Bernard brought up in his comments, that she shares with them, that is her liberal critics, is that a populist politics necessarily terminates in a Caesarist politics of authoritarian personalism. 
or what Shayla in her paper calls an autocratic presidentialism. So there are, it's not that there are no arguments to support that connection. So this is all pointing to the third example of disambiguation, I think, that, that Bernard is, is talking about. There are a variety of arguments that are usually invoked for asserting the entailment between these things or the necessary connection. Gene tonight uh, described it as an elective affinity. Some of these defenses are more theoretical, such as Mouffe's very brief gloss on uh, Freudian group psychology, at least in this book. It's, it's quite thin. Um, or the dynamics of identification that lead to the crystallization of affects that are necessary for what she calls the motor of political action. Shayla in her paper gets it. I think, I think the, the centrality of Schmidt is absolutely key. So kind of qualitative identification uh, understanding of democracy like you find in the preface to the crisis of uh, parliamentary democracy or what Jean talks about in terms of the model of incarnation that you can draw from the work of Lafour and so on and so forth. Some of the defenses are a bit more pragmatic. Uh, that is, attempts to, to unite populism with this kind of authoritarian personalism, um, more practical. That is, those that emphasize that the anti-establishment quality of the populist leader bypasses all intermediary associations like parties or the traditional media and holds direct communication with the people by Twitter and so on or the radio in order to prove that the leader is always identified with that people against any establishment representation. So it kind of emerges out of this broader crisis of representation. I always think that a certain example of popular authoritarianism stands behind some of these arguments and helps to vivify them. That is to say, the example of somebody like uh, Orban or Erdogan and maybe not so much Podemos or the case that I know the best, which is a, a late 19th century American case of agrarian populism, which is not about immediacy. It's not about popular identification with authoritarian leader. It was about an incredible cultural movement of egalitarianism that also had remarkable forms of, ex of institutional experimentation, like in the Farmers' Alliance. So for me, I feel like those of us that are interested in a radical egalitarian politics that might be populist would not want to go with MOOF in siding with this immediate association of populism with personalist authoritarianism, like that in this book she lays out around page 70. Um, I think those of us that want to articulate a more robust, egalitarian, radical democratic vision would want to spend more time unpacking the persuasiveness of those arguments that so try, so, uh, try to kind of tether uh, populism with this personalist authoritarianism. I think in Mouffe's failure to do this, she makes her left populism a more easy target of her liberal critics than um, it would otherwise have to be. So I'll leave it at that. Okay, thanks. Thank you so much, Jason. <laughs> Let me uh, pass the mic down. Uh, Jedediah, do you want to jump in? Some thoughts? And, and then Camila. Um, I'll just hold it. Okay, so my uh, so much has been said that is so illuminating. I won't list the many points of admiration I have for what's already been said. Um, and I'll deliberately take the parochial perspective of an American scholar of American constitutional history and politics. Um, I hope it may add something, though something of limited scope. Um, I had the odd experience, an experience of nominalism, but I think more than nominalism, over the last two days of preparing for this seminar while also preparing to teach a minor classic in my field, Aziz Rana's wonderful book, The Two Faces of American Freedom. Rana, some of you know, is a noted constitutional scholar and important historian of certain radical democratic branches of the black freedom movement. 
In that book, populism stands for all that is best in the potential of the American political order and indeed democratic aspiration generally, stands for repeated attempts exemplified in, but not restricted to, the um, late 19th century agrarian populist movement, attempts to universalize a strong form of joint political economic citizenship. Efforts repeatedly and tragically in the book's narration subsumed under successful blends of majoritarian practices of identitarian exclusion and subordination and elite capture of anti-majoritarian institutions. So, as I say, maybe slightly more than nominalism that this experience of, of mixed consciousness over the last two days gave me. Um, it points to a couple of threads of American experience of these themes. One is a very simple one, but I'll, I'll name it polemically. In this setting, at least, it's very clear that while we are worrying about the pathologies of reducing democratic sovereignty to the will of the present majority, which indeed we should do, we might also try it for the first time. Um, it is, after all, the case that our current president is in office only in consequence of a set of anti-majoritarian constitutional institutions, right? He couldn't win a plurality of the office, and his best chance at entrenching himself is via the anti-majoritarian Senate and anti-majoritarian Supreme Court. Now, it may be that the U.S. is just like all pathological countries, pathological in its own way. Um, if you read, for instance, Jeremy Waldron's classic case against constitutional review, you'll find that the main takeaway is that in an argument directed at um, the, func the ideal operation of a well-functioning democracy, you'll discover by the end that if you're an American, you're not living in one. And so the argument's application sort of falls apart. So maybe it's just our problem. But I will observe that in the history of constitutional contest here, it is demonstrably true that much progress that the egalitarian left values is due to polarizing attacks on high courts and on other constitutional limits, specifically on the inherently unbounded sovereignty of the people and on the assertion thereof. And those who have identified with and articulated such attacks include such paragons of the American constitutional tradition as Abraham Lincoln, who asserted that unbounded sovereign capacity in the face of the then Chief Justice of the High Court, Franklin Roosevelt famously, and also the young Felix Frankfurter, who said that sometimes the justices have to have the fear of God put in them and have their cages shaken. Um, now, let's come to the present. <clears throat> it, it is, I think, true here this, this now has to do less with the question of popular sovereignty and constitutionalism than with the question of polarizing and anti-elite campaigns and the affinity with a kind of exclusionary nationalism. It is true here that the most polarizing and anti-elite campaigns, the ones with the best claim to be characterized or most susceptibility to being characterized as left nationalist, are also the ones most committed to substantive forms of cross-border solidarity and to building up forms of internationalism executed on the platform of national sovereignty, but not restricted in their motives there too. I think here of the movement around the Sanders campaign, but also let's think of AOC, a favorite, um, clearly a polarizing anti-elite candidate who began one episode of her campaign in a, period, in a solidarity vigil at the border, right? Um, so it seems to me that there's a limited traction in the politics that I know best for the populist category. And it seems to me that if I, if I were to try to state the stakes locally, um, of competing versions of, shall we say, political affect, aesthetic 
genre, whatever it is we want to call the populist strategy. I would identify Trumpism's distinguishing character as a political nihilism, a reduction of the rhetoric and practice of politics to a purely expressive or emotional register. This is someone who has never promised to do what politics signally in its modern form does, which is to change the rules of social cooperation. He's promised only to intermittently win by them and to defy them in ways that will be gratifying according to a narrow set of identitarian contrasts. By contrast, it seems to me that the Sanders movement stood precisely for a sort of specifically political restoration of, of um, self-governing capacity, precisely for the assertion that political mobilization can change the rules on which cooperation takes place on the platform, again, of national sovereignty, but with concerns and context not, of course, restricted to that setting. And it seems to me that there are stakes in the distinction between this left mobilization and the centrist restorationism, I would say, of a certain constitutional settlement that prevailed during the Cold War in the long 1990s and whose ideal is to get us back to the period of imagined technocratic consensus um, that several uh, earlier commentators have alluded to and which um, persisted until sometime in, 19, in 2016, according to this imaginary. So yes, I think there are stakes among these political moods. None, I think, is precisely populist in a way captured by the strongest forms um, of threat characterization in our discussion. But I would also say none of, the, uh, none of the promise that I mean to describe here is interestingly captured by or addressed by Chantal Mouffe's recommendation. Um, it seems to me that her choice of Thatcher is indeed very telling here because indeed the whole history of mainstream US ideological contest is a history of the conjuring of iterative, normative, authoritative versions of the people in precisely the fashion that Thatcher achieved. Um, she is, in a sense, adopting an idea of what it is to succeed politically that I think naturalizes certain forms of, um, of politics that, in fact, not only aren't desirable, but actually aren't essential. When the new left politics is most interesting, it doesn't need the language of the people. It needs the language of the horizon of political possibility, and that is the register in which we've seen it advance in the last couple of years. Those are mine. Thank you, Jed. Um, thanks. Okay. So let's hear from Camila Vergara, and then we'll come back to our, um, and then we'll come back here, and then we'll go to you, Dana. Okay. Go Thank ahead. you, uh, Bernard. First of all, I would like to make an amendment of your uh, yes, disambiguation. It's a, it's a wiki um, page, I would say um, Latin America post 1945, we should be reading uh, historical populism because, uh, as the previous two speakers have already um, said, populism was not born in Latin America, was not born in Europe, but it was not born. Um, in the US, but actually was born in Russia. And uh, it was the first time that populism was used as a concept. And uh, actually Lenin deride, didn't like populism because it was too systemic, because it actually uh, preserved private ownership of land, of the agricultural sectors. And then uh, as the People's Party in the US also was um, a, a self-governing uh, interracial alliance, feminist even, uh, at that point, and this was uh, also um, uh, materialized in, in Latin American populism. So Perón, I know that um, Federico has his own take, being an Argentinian, uh, we know in Latin America we think about Argentina as the exceptionals. It's the, like the US of uh, Latin America because you know everything is exceptional. And actually when we study uh, political parties in comparative politics, studying Peronism is just a mess. Nobody wants to deal with Argentinian party system because it's so unique. Um, so. In Latin America, the Perón actually constitutionalized workers' rights. So going into the same thread, like labor-based movement in 
in both uh, uh, Russia, uh, uh, the US, and Latin America. The same happened in the pink tide. So Venezuela, Bolivia, and Ecuador, they're the three governments that actually have been in power for more than a decade. And they have reverted poverty, they have uh, slashed inequality, and of course, they have done another th other things, but at least in that kind of ideological uh, uh, line, they have been uh, very uh, in, in congruence with uh, the historical populism. So this is the first thing. Um, and of course, uh, uh, my, my, one, one of my, my biggest problems with the definition is the left-right dichotomy that actually starts being used only in the 80s. Before, it was just populism. That's it. And it was always based on the popular sectors. They excluded popular sectors and against the oligarchy, not any elite, the oligarchs. It was uh, about redistribution, uh, progressive ta taxation, nationalization of transportation, um, and so on and so forth. Um, so what do we mean by left populism? Because now Chantal Mouffe has actually moved into embracing a left patriotism. And this is very problematic because it's, it's a, what is left left about this left patriotism or left nationalism that she is advocating for. So what do we mean by left and right um, dichotomy? And then I want to problematize with the incarnation model. Because um, even if I agree that the first experiments were a, a grassroots alliances of workers' organizations, so therefore the leaderless, horizontal, um, they are in Latin America, because of the presidentialist system, we need to take into account the system of government is presidentialist or is uh, parliamentarism. So we have Podemos in Spain and it's not the same as having a presidentialist system in Bolivia. So all these uh, governments have, uh, they have had these strong leaders. But we cannot talk about incarnation in Bolivia, for example. Evo Morales does not incarnate populism or the people. Actually, the whole, uh, the, the, the whole um, uh, organization of power around Morales was based on social movements of indigenous populations, and they have been the most active in confronting Morales. So he, in, in the Bolivian context, there's no incarnation. There is a mobilization, partisan mobilization, yes, but it's not an incarnation, an embodiment of power. I don't know what we mean by this. Uh, I, I don't see any historical um, uh, proof of incarnation of power, at least in what we call left-wing populism. Chavez was, of course, a, a, a symbolic leader, and Hannah Pitkin has gone in, in, in this regard, talking about symbolic representation. How do we jump from symbolic representation to incarnation? And this is a move that I don't see. This sparse prototologic, I don't see it anywhere, because the people is never the full Bolivian people. It's actually the working, the popular sectors, the indigenous populations. They're always a qualifier, and there's no, not even the, the attempt at supplanting the citizenship as a whole. So I don't see this move, and I think this is self-defeating, because uh, hegemony is a very difficult thing to achieve. And the only hegemony today is a neoliberal hegemony or, or uh, 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 another forms of hegemony, and it's not a popular hegemony. So for the popular sectors to actually go there is very difficult. Um, yes, that's it. Thank you. Okay. Thank you so much, Camilla. Um, so, uh, so what I propose is that we return to our panelists for some reactions to these uh, comments. Um, we'll probably stop applauding at this point um, and just go into kind of like a discourse, I mean, kind of conversation. Um, and we'll start with uh, Shayla and then we'll head down uh, and then we'll try and catch another round of uh, comments and questions. Okay. Well, continuing on the disambiguation track, I want to say the following. When Bruce Ackerman writes of we the people, he does not mean Chantal Mouffe's people. Why? Because uh, the concept of the people, as we know, can have many, many different meanings. But we, the people, in uh, the way in which it is used by someone like Ackerman, refers to the people who are the subject of what Arendt calls constitutio libertatis, the process of constituting itself through institutions, articulating itself in in institutions, giving itself a constitution. So the contrast between the people versus the establishment that Chantal operates with is a very simplistic contrast. I think that the attraction of populism comes from that elusive concept of popular sovereignty, we the people to which we are all committed. And all progressive, you know, good po no, politics, of course, 
you know, it is about, in some ways, we, the people, but you can take a ground shield line there. We, the people, is a call to build a coalition. It is a call to build institutions. It is a call to articulation, <clears throat> not disarticulation. One of the things that makes me um, very puzzled, and I think I heard Didier mention this, is uh, I never understood this phrase that is used uh, by Chantal and Ernest uh, uh, saint Lacla also. What are the chain of equivalences in politics? I don't understand this. Away from working class essentialism, what does it mean to refer to women's politics, queer politics, migrant politics, farmers' politics in terms of a chain of equivalences? The task of politics is when the equivalences fall out. And you have to try to negotiate, you have to argue, you have to come together, and you have to go apart. Don't forget, Bernie Sanders' movement was subject, as much as I admire that movement, was subject to a lot of criticism from African Americans as well as women. And Alexandro Ocasio-Cortez is, in fact, somebody who apparently got together with people from the Bernie Sanders movement in Brooklyn. So what are we talking about when we are talking about what I call the politics of the comma? Okay, and then there was the working class, comma, and then there were the women, and then comma, there were the migrants, come on. Let's be a bit more concrete, and I think that this is what I heard Aisheng getting into, that politics is always, so you have, to, you have to consider the strategic field and that sometimes left populists may end up doing the politics, serving the politics of right populists. So, um, and uh, to conclude here, I think I understand uh, our desire to try to retrieve out of the concept of the people the valuable notion of a popular sovereignty. But popular sovereignty is not simply defined in terms of this opposition or rage against the establishment. It requires courage and imagination and articulation and building new institutions, even just in anticipation, the kind of cooperatives that you were referring to, uh, Jed. And it's clear that the American progressive movement, I mean, Michael Kazin has a very good book on this as well, was a fountainhead of ideas. So I don't want to say that populist movements cannot be maybe experimentally generating some proposals for the future shape of a, of a society. Um, I'll just say uh, two sentences. I think there is a basic difference between uh, choosing your uh, identity groups first and then bringing them together and then trying to create a people out of them, uh, which, you know, Chantal Mouf has to devote quite a bit of attention. And there is another type of left-leaning politics, which I try to disambiguate. And according to that, on the basis of injustice, exploitation, discrimination, racism, historical forms of uh, injustice, uh, people, when they want to reverse these, these structural, very much established uh, continuities, they get together on an issue basis uh, kind of transformative politics, and they cooperate with one another, they come up with solutions, uh, and on the basis of that, a solidarity is built, and then you have a people. Uh, you, don't, you don't just pick the portion of the people you want to ally yourself with and try to forge a people out of them to come to power with them. Because that is, from the very beginning, exclusionary first. Second, it's not transformative. You're not dealing with the others. You're not really dealing with the society. You're not addressing the public concerns. So you're not addressing injustice as a systemic thing. You're just in interested in injustice as it affects my friend X, Y, Z. So I think there is a basic difference between those two positions and a completely different kind of politics derives out of those. <sighs> OK. Is this on? No. Yes? All right. Um, well, Bernard, we really do have a, a, a quite a serious disagreement because 
if you go the route of nominalism, then there's no concepts left. You can't stick with nominalism. Uh, so that's not going to work with anything because, well, at least political theorists deal with concepts. Uh, and I spoke of an ideal type. I wonder if we really even know. Did anybody ever read Max Weber hear what an ideal type is? It's not the same thing as a concept, but is it is a construction um, that, uh, well, that is meant as an heuristic that we can then use. I'm not going to go into more on this, but in any case, you wouldn't know anything about, you couldn't even use the word populist if you just went with nominalism because you couldn't distinguish between uh, every single party and, every, and including Bruce Ackerman, et cetera, who refer to we the people. So just referring to we the people against the least is not enough to construct any understanding of populism whatsoever. So I disagree. Um, with that approach, and it, it's not a, that's not even a discursive conception, it's just a word. So I think we've got to go further than that, and the reason I set up an ideal type was that you could then come look at empirical instances and see, is it more or less populist? You can construct a different ideal type, hey, you know, whatever, but you don't get, you, you have no illumination if you don't do that, and since the word is out there, we better deal with it. Okay, that's the first thing. Second thing is, I don't know why everybody's so obsessed with anti-essentialism. I got bad news for you. Klaus Schmidt was not an essentialist. He was just as anti-essentialist as Chantal Mouffe. Uh, that, that doesn't make it, that doesn't make it, uh, that, in other words, there are still problems with it, to say the least. And so the anti-essentialism is, is certainly not enough. Uh, and um, in, in, to a certain degree, it's a problem. Of course, the offers that are given by theorists of, who the people are. They have to be accepted. It has to have some resonance, otherwise it's not going to get off the ground. But that's another discussion. Um, now, in terms of the uh, discussion about Mouffe's diagnosis and that, that Didier mentioned, um, I see a different problem with it. For A, number one, to whoever, I don't remember who said this, number one, I don't know, I didn't hear anybody in this room say populism is the cause of the problem. I said populism is the wrong response to the neoliberal, whatever the hell you want to call it, all this stuff that's been going on since we moved from industrial to post-industrial society, since you had you know, consensus politics and all of that. I never, none of us, at least I didn't say it's the cause, I said it's the wrong response. So that's not the same thing. Um, but Moose's diagnosis, unfortunately, goes beyond the description of the stuff about post-democracy that she takes from Crouch and Rancière, um, and says, I'm gonna give you an analysis of post-democracy, and then that's her Schmidtian turn. It's basically rooted in the inherent contradictions of liberalism and democracy. That's her analysis. That's her theory of it. It's a different ballgame. So uh, the, the Schmidtian dimension is quite there. Nobody picked up on the equality difference dichotomy. Populist politics is identity politics, at least the versions that we've been discussing. The American case is quite distinct. Um, by the way, they didn't win. They didn't reach power, when they merged with the Democratic Party, there were some alarming features that, uh, that Williams Jen Jennings Bryan and, you know, they turned racist, et cetera. But, okay, I think it's very important to distinguish, and I tried to do this, and in the paper I do more, between a movement which can be very diverse, which is not, even if they call themselves populist, there's nothing necessarily authoritarian in that. A movement, a party movement, and that's a concept. A party movement is a concept. It's a party movement or a movement party. I can refer to some books on that. And a political party, they're not the same. And when uh, you move from, the pop, from a movement to a party movement and that party movement gains power and then refuses to differentiate between the movement and the party part, in other words, they remain fundamentalists, they, um, uh, uh, they well, okay, I don't want to go into it, I don't have enough time, but in a, if you don't differentiate, then there's a step towards authoritarianism. The American Populist Party never got there. They lost, the progressives institutionalized a lot of their stuff, not enough. That's a different ballgame. So I, th I agree with you, I like Postel's book on American populism very much, by the way, and um, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't fit it into, it's just, the na it was their name, but I wouldn't put it into, I wouldn't situate it in the current context that we're talking about. We're talking about other kinds of party movements. Um, and then finally, uh, uh, well, no, that's enough. So Bernard, I, I think you put me in the fourth category because you had nobody to put there. Uh, and 
and I can I can take it, but but I was also uh, you know in the fifth and probably in others as I think most of us uh, were we are navigating in uh, in this different, but but that's <clears throat> that's a parenthesis. So the first the first point is that uh, I think uh, we uh, we should take seriously, and I, I'm sure we do, but but she doesn't uh, seriously uh, the historical uh, uh, situated examples and not uh, and, and 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 especially uh, it, those we which we have uh, are not in Europe uh, so far except Syriza uh, they are in Latin America and that's where we should we should look carefully and if we if we look carefully I think uh, there's a series of things that that we have to remember uh, and most of you know of course but uh, first these um, uh, left populists who were elected uh, very often with very wide majorities, uh, not only in the uh, so-called popular classes, working classes, but also uh, in the case of Chavez, for example, in the middle class as well, uh, they were elected in a time where it was uh, this uh, increasing uh, uh, wave of neoliberalism, very destructive of the welfare system, uh, and and in the case, uh, in particular, the case of Venezuela, but there was a, in other also uh, a level of corruption that was extraordinary. So, so they were. Uh, that's how they were seen, and and that, uh, and and they they started their programs, their policies. Uh, with uh, very uh, radical, at least radical for considering the situation, uh, programs of uh, uh, to, uh, as I said earlier, to decrease inequality, to uh, to increase uh, uh, to, to decrease illiteracy, etc. Um, and in some cases, some programs on environment, although they were not very successful at that, most of them, uh, and, and others. So, so, so I think the image that. Uh, we have, uh, you know, in the uh, uh, mainstream media to today, about 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 this, uh, are uh, very biased, and they are biased. Uh, 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 but but still, uh, we have to wonder what happened uh, to these uh, to, to, to 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 these uh, governments, and, and uh, because uh, in in several cases they went pretty wrong. Uh, and they were pretty wrong, uh, which, and you have an indicator of that when, when you have, uh, in the case of uh, Rafael Correa, for example, but Chavez as well, and uh, uh, when you have against you uh, the trade unions, the left, uh, uh, and the uh, uh, indigenous uh, uh, organizations, there's probably a problem for a left-wing government. So, so, so the question really is, uh, to differentiate, because I think uh, the situation, as you said, the situation in Bolivia is not the same as the situation in Venezuela. Uh, it is, uh, I would say, it is much better uh, <clears throat> uh, today. Uh, but still, there's there's something that that is problematic, and Bernard addressed it in in his uh, uh, in, in his uh, note, uh, initial note, which is the uh, the the problem from uh, conquering power and perhaps even uh, implementing the first measure and then staying in power, which is really uh, something that, 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 is, uh, that, that should be uh, re reflected upon. The, the second point, uh, and I will have only two, uh, the second point is that I think we should also, I mean, uh, of course that's not the topic today, but uh, so we've been speaking, and she does, uh, about uh, left-wing populism, or left populism and right popul populism. Uh, there's also a center populism, and I think we have to. Uh, to, 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 to uh, there's someone recently wrote in France an article about the violence of the center, uh, and and if you if you take as an example uh, France, which uh, which in recent uh, in the last two years, which has been seen from abroad as such an example of uh, 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 a, a, a president which was. Uh, Against uh, which was the, the last rampart against uh, 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 the uh, uh, the far right, it is remarkable that what he has done. So first of all, to be elected, he had to present uh, 
a, a very dichotomic view of politics where you have the political parties, the right, the left, we're done with that. And uh, although he was representing the oligarchy himself, being a, a former Rothschild banker, uh, he, was, uh, he, 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 was, he was really uh, posing this, this division. But then when he was elected, uh, he, what, what he did was uh, to try to be in direct contact with the people by uh, weakening the parliament, by uh, uh, weakening the political parties, by weakening the unions, and that is all the intermediary uh, bodies uh, 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 in politics. And, uh, uh, and this with, the, with this uh, extraordinary idea of, which is a misinterpretation of Claude Lefort, uh, whom she, he, has, he has read, which is that when Claude Lefort says that uh, there's this empty space uh, uh, of uh, of, of, the, uh, of, the, uh, of power, of, 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 the, of the democracy. Uh, for, for Claude Lefort, it is something that should remain empty because it's pre precisely what produces democracy and, and the questioning of democracy permanently. So the misunderstanding, <laughs> perhaps, uh, for uh, his own interest of, uh, uh, of uh, Emmanuel Macron is that uh, this he has to fill this empty space uh, because, it were, because the, the, the French people remain traumatized, traumatized by the death of Louis XVI, which, uh, which, which is uh, absolutely. And, and, this, and this, is, this is how, in the end, this is how, in the end, he gets in that extraordinarily difficult situation today because having uh, uh, weakened, weakened the, uh, the intermediary bodies is confronted to a, a, a movement, a, a pe people, uh, not the people, but people, who are directly addressing, it, addressing him and directly uh, confronting him and, uh, and, and wanting his fall. So, so, so I think we have also to, to think of, uh, of what is populism when it's neither Right, no left. Okay, three, uh, three quick, quick points. First kind of um, relates to the quasi-methodological debate that has already been unfolding on this, on this panel as well. It seems to me the two biggest dangers in this discussion are A, a kind of homogenization of very different experiences, and secondly, a tendency now to kind of over-specify populism and say this is sort of, you know, the populist form of leadership, this is the populist approach to the media, this is the populist approach to uh, the economy, this is the populist approach to having a pet in the White House or not, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and as an alternative, I would suggest, and this sort of, I mean, I'm happy with an ideal type, but maybe a different vocabulary that might be helpful is to talk about family resemblances and in a very crude way, point out that if you were to put Orban, Chavez, Erdogan, Trump, possibly Modi, and a couple of other characters next to each other, eventually you would kind of say, yeah, many important differences, but you know what? They are part of one family. And among other things, what they would all also be engaged in, my proposition in this context, is finding a way of saying that we and only we, or I and only I, represent the people. And that's very different from just an appeal to the people. I would say that an appeal to the people, or people talk in general, is part of politics as a vocation or as a profession. If you had somebody who says, look, I've got all these fantastic technical solutions to all these problems, and then you ask them, but what is your conception of where, let's say, the American people should go? And they would say, you know what, I never thought about that. I think we, we would find that slightly deficient. But there's a difference between somebody who makes that appeal as a kind of fallible hypothesis and then is ready to accept disagreement, is ready to have that vision invalidated at the polls, as opposed to somebody who is not going to accept disagreement, who is going to reduce disagreement to a claim that comes down to saying, you don't really belong. So if I don't clap for the current president, he's going to say you're un-American. That's a very different response 
than somebody who says, well, we have disagreements, but we can work it out within some kind of common, common parameters. One last quick point. Um, Jason's framing of, you know, Move and her liberal critics. The danger I see there is that we end up in a situation where she and the proponents of populism, of course, in one way or another, get democracy, and then all these critics, you know, sort of look like, well, you know, they have all these reservations about democracy, and they're probably going to want to stick up for counter-majoritarian institutions, and so on and so forth. And I think what's important to say is, some, some people on the panel have also underlined, populists in power undermine democracy itself with their exclusionary moves. So it's not just, oh, we have to save liberalism from these dangerous you know, mobs and so on. No, it's democracy, it's democracy itself. And I think that matters conceptually, but it also matters strategically. Because you know, if Orban, with his self-declared illiberal democracy, gets to keep democracy, he says, great. I never wanted to be a liberal to begin with. Plus, it leaves in place a wonderful division of labor where the nation state gets democracy, and then the EU and all these nitpickers you know, from Brussels who kind of come in and repair the rule of law in, of course, very technocratic fashion, they, of course, are the liberals. Now, that's not a theoretical argument, but at the level of rhetoric, it really matters. Whether you, tell to, whether you t say to people, look, you know, what matters for us is also democracy, or whether you say, well, of course, we're the liberals around here, and we basically are afraid of you guys. Very different forms of, of framing the problem to begin with. Thanks, Jan. Um, I'm going to try to not to say anything and, and pass the, power, uh, um, the um, mic to, to Dana and then to Rosalind for some uh, interventions. Although, I'll just say one quick thing. If, 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 if you, if I, 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 I'm, I'm ready to move in the direction of family resemblances, but when you start lining up, uh, you know, Orban, Trump, Modi, Erdogan, et cetera, the, the notion that comes to my mind is not populism, but neo-fascism of some sort, or how fascism works, and something like that, right? Sure. Uh, but 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 uh, but I don't think that it's the, I don't think that actually we're getting closer to a useful definition of a term here. I think we would go. I think I would be pushed towards you know uh, Jason Stanley's description of how fascism works. Maybe Dana. Thank you and thank you for all the uh, interventions, which are uh, very illuminating. And my uh, three critic points, which are in a way. Um, attempts to also think about the larger question of what can we learn from this book for praxis. And so three, th three things that really struck me when reading. The first one was the, uh, the lack of really of substance. And if for a moment we bracket the question of populism and names and just ask, so how would, a, as she says, partisan intervention, which is somehow oriented at a left optimism or the stream of a real left movement, which I share, um, proceed, then it strikes me as so astonishing how this is only strategy and no topics. And some, the few things that pop up, like the ecological question must be central, um, clearly I can agree with, but then also how she frames, for instance, that she says the ecological question must be central and it will be very useful when we connect it with a social question. Well, I disagree. I think it is connected, and I believe that a left optimism would have to build on the notion that we have to show these connections rather than establish them. And at one point, she speaks about recruiting people. Which, so just, I, I think it's not merely a disagreement in how one should be talking about these issues. Um, it's also a disagreement in strategy, but it's mainly a really a theoretical point. And I think it's not sound how, to think that one could build a left populism, or however one wants to call it, anyway, a left strategy merely on strategy. Um, the second point that strikes me uh, is a little bit in the direction of what Shayla um, and also Federico raised with that migration is so absent here. But I would try it a little bit and say, so when she speaks about what is the conjuncture from which she's writing, what is the striking situation we find ourselves in, speaks about Europe, and then I just not only find the absence of migration and themes of transnationalism, but I would say it's, it's almost conceding the ground to the right to say this is, that the current moment is only about migration. It may have started with migration, but what we see is really an exclusion of 
persons who, of citizens from those countries along racial and re religious lines. So it's in a way an us versus them, them, which is not really us versus the establishment, but us versus those, the Muslims, those who do not belong to the people, although they might have citizenship. So uh, certainly it's linked in many cases with an anti-establishment discourse, but this, I think this is important to note, and this is why this absence in the book strikes me so much, because when she talks about effect later on and gives these small examples how one could have sort of a, a light version of patriotism to uh, give a positive sentiment, I think we need to note first what is so successful in recruiting effects in people. And that is not the anti-establishment, but the anti, the exclusion within the people mode. And the last very quick point um, is that what strikes me in a more sympathetic way when she says, well, suddenly I find myself in a situation having to defend social democratic uh, status quo, which before I was always criticizing as insufficient. So I can agree with that. But I think then this brings us to a really theoretical problem that she has with this idea that we should never strive for agreement. Because to, to learn that may, we might have to defend something we are not in agreement with first and build coalitions and have concrete political projects in a way I think is a real problem for this hegemonic um, model. Thank you. Thank you, Dana. Rosalind? Is it on? I, I thought tonight's blogs were really fantastic. This was an exceptionally good panel, and I learned so much. And one of the things that came across this evening in the discussion, even more than in the panels, was the degree to which Moof's text really can be read perhaps most usefully as symptomatic of that which it diagnoses, that the, the, the um, understanding of populism as somehow Schmittian in its core of having reduced the question of the relationship with the other to the question of the enemy in the first place, of having substantialized the people and therefore foreclosed the question of the future, and, and the reduction of the problem of mediation to that of representation all those three elements of the populist problem and or the populist moment are reproduced in her text in ways that it's not a critical analysis of that. It partakes of that in its, in its diagnostics. But I, just, I was just interested in the lack of address among ourselves to the subjective question uh, of populism. That is, what it is that allows for people who are disenfranchised, marginalized, excluded, to believe and to feel deeply, deeply, passionately that a leader of a particular sort can indeed represent their being, their interest, their needs, their aspirations. This is not going to be solved with some kind of, you know, light version of Le Bon or Freud. Uh, um, and I think in this case it would be useful to do what we did a little bit at the last session, which is turn back to the previous wave of populisms that arose in the wake of a financial crisis, that in Southeast Asia in the late 90s, pre-9-11. Uh, you remember People's Power Movement in the Philippines? I mean, one after the other after the other country found themselves enveloped in powerful populist movements that led to the restitution of either military monarchist alliances or some kind of oligarchical, usually media-based capital. And if you asked people in that context, what could possibly be the basis of your identifying with someone a million times wealthier than you, who has nothing in common with you, except at the most basic levels of race and or sexual identity, and those are powerful frameworks for identification, it was almost always the belief that that oligarchical person was also the victim of persecution by the state. And in this way, those figures managed to, that is, they were often under, um, uh, the, the leaders were often very quickly subject to or had already been subject to prosecution on corruption charges, tax evasion, various things. And this, I, mean, I know this from my own ethnographic experience, this idea that those exceptional leaders were like the poorest people only in this regard, that they were oppressed by the state, was, f was one of the means by which a kind of the neoliberal engine got its new juice and, um, and allowed for 
this very strange uh, political formation in which the state would be used to, of course, mitigate the capacity of the state to do what it had previously done, redistribute. At the same time, those figures managed to appropriate the redistributive function of more left politics, but in the mode of clientelism. To distribute goods, often subsidies for things like rice or what have you, but always in their own name, as gifts, as benefits distributed by virtue of personal clientelistic relations. And this double move, yeah? First, the creation of identification. We're both subject to persecution by an intrusive, bureaucratic, insensitive, and violent state apparatus. And secondly, we know that the redistributive function needs to be performed, but we'll now do it in a personalist way, precisely to the side of the state. That strikes me as one of the, those features which were so visible in Southeast Asia now come back in a much more generalized form. And if there is something that makes that line up, of people who are coming into populist uh, movements a after, not all in the long tradition of the 40 years of neoliberal Hayekian welfare statism, but in the aftermath of socialist projects, in military monarchist contexts, and so forth. Like, very different political economic regimes are seeing the rise of populist movements. But the thing that binds them all, I think, is this double move. And it's there that people are called subjectively to invest. It's not just superimposed from the top by these leaders claiming to be able to incarnate the people. It's desired. It's avowed. It's championed. And I think we, we need, that question needs to be a, a supplement to the other more normative, descriptive, theoretical analyses of populism that we've had on the table. Thank you, Rosalind. Um, that was, uh, yeah, I think that's an important piece that we really haven't really explored, which is the, the psychological dimension uh, and the way you mentioned. Uh, we've kind of approached the end of our time, except that there's one person who's been standing and waiting patiently to just say a word. And so do you want to say, can you say a word? It's a question, sure. Make, go ahead, quickly, and yeah. yeah. Or take the mic, quickly. Well, thank you. This was really interesting, especially when the disagreement came up. I happen to agree with the half of the speakers who think that left populism is a contradiction in terms. But that's why I wanted to ask you the hard questions that the other people have been asking and want to know your answer, which is, it seems to me you're, in the spirit of Didier's intervention, you wanted to historicize this. You've been taking the easy cases of why left populism is a contradiction in terms. Chavez uh, or La France Insoumise. What do you do with the hard cases, which are the cases they have in mind, which are not in your list of people? And I think the, pop, the, people, the, the people's movement of uh, the, the, popular, the People's Party of the USA, but more importantly, I think the more interesting one is the one that uh, Bernard raised at the beginning. Is uh, Bernie Sanders a populist for you? Uh, and it seems to me the move you guys want to make, and you, you make it, Jan, explicitly in your book, and Jean, you said it before, is to say the People's Party was not a populist party. Or, well, Jan says it explicit. Uh, <laughs> and, but that's weird, right? It's weird, because maybe we don't want to be nominalist, but it's weird to say that a party that thinks of itself as populist is not populist. And I, to my understanding, many people associated with Sanders also think of themselves, including AOC, as populist. So from a position of agreement with, with you that says, I agree with you that left populism is a contradiction in terms, what do you respond to the people who say, isn't Sanders a populist? Sanders thinks he's a populist. Okay. Um, so... Um, so uh, we're going to, uh, obviously, so the, the blog is still open, and hopefully we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna maybe uh, get some responses there. Uh, is there anyone on the panel who wants to have a final word? Uh, uh, Jan, uh, is, it just, is, is, uh, can you give me a yes or no answer? That's a lawyer's question. Is Bernie Sanders a populist? No? Okay. All right. Okay. Well, the conversation goes on. We've had extraordinary contributions on the blog and here in person from our guests and from uh, all of our panelists and commentators. Thank you so much. <laughs>